It's the Fellowship of the Geek Show, a weekly podcast about comics, the comic book industry, and other geek pop culture. Music courtesy of Manny the Martyr. And now, on with the show! Hey everybody, it's the Fellowship of the Geeks podcast. My name is Thomas Chick, and joining me for this episode is Mike Marlowe. Hey gang. And Les Webster. Hello all. Unfortunately, Liz uh, Newman is under the weather, so she couldn't join us tonight. Get well soon, Liz. Hopefully we'll have you back uh, next week. Yeah. Yeah, what I said. Yeah, what he said. (laughs) <laughs> I iterate. Sounds painful to me. I was just say you could get, go get some cream, get that cleared up, man. <laughs> We're starting <laughs> early. Right out of the gate. Sure, why not? Sure, why not? So, what's been going on in your corner of the galaxy? Um. Well, I just decided this week it was time to read some trades. So. I'm whittling down at my list again. Um, so this week I uh, pulled out uh, one of the one of Alex DeCampi's Grindhouse books. Uh, I think it was Volume Three. Um, and if you're not familiar with those, they're a whole lot of fun. It, they're just these little. They actually the trades are two two separate stories, and each of them I believe when they were in floppies, I think each. I think each story was two issues. So they're not, I mean, they're your standard for four issue trade, but it's two stories and it's got, they got this like flip book thing going and it's, it's, they're kind of cool. And they're just, just fun, nasty little grindhouse type stories. It's, it's, it's pretty fun. Um, and I also grabbed volume one of the fix. Um, I guess talking about it last week was enough to make me think, Hey, I need to start getting it back getting into this since they're starting to put them out again. Hopefully consistently. Um, and now I am in the middle of uh, Walter Simonson's Ragnarok, which started. Ooh. God, that's probably two years ago now. That started. Yeah. Um, I got well, the volume one trade for that, and that's it's a really pretty book, and it's 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 don't get it. It has nothing to. It's like I said, it's an IDW book. It has nothing to do with Marvel's Thor. So. This is a totally different, much more mythologically consistent Thor in a post Ragnarok world. It's 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 pretty dark and it's pretty mythological and it's a lot of fun. And the the those Grindhouse trades were from Dark Horse. I, re, I remember those. I remember those coming out. And yes, there were four enjoyed, of them. Yeah, enjoy the heck out of those. Yep. Cool. Less. I took on the trade put out by DC of Jack Kirby's run on Challengers of the Unknown, which consisted of 12 issues, the four showcase issues, and then the first eight issues of the title itself. And it has been so much fun catching up on this and seeing even how his style changed. I talked with Thomas last weekend, I believe it was, that his style had changed considerably because of the anchor. There was so much difference between uh, Kirby's Marvel things and this title which came before Marvel was even around. So uh, it's been fun to to read and uh, compare to some of his Marvel stuff. This is a lot cleaner, and the inks are not as heavy as they were in the Marvel series. So to me, they're a pleasure. I also picked up 
uh, JLA year one and got about two thirds of the way through that. And that's nice to go back and reread itself. So if you can either find the, uh, the trade on that, or if you can find your issues, go back and reread it because it's fascinating stuff. Just how they open up with all the different characters. They, they made, they fleshed them out very well. Cool. Uh, remind me who did that. Was that Kitson on art? Yes. I can't remember who wrote it. Was it, was it Wade or? Is Mark Wade. Okay. Wow. Okay. Good job. <laughs> it's, it's been a while since I've read it. I rem- I bet I remember that because that was the, that was the post crisis, uh, Team, so Superman and Batman were, or Superman was not involved, and Wonder Woman had been replaced by Black Canary in that the, the founding members, yes. if I remember correctly. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I remember that being a good read. I, I remember. I, I wouldn't mind checking that up again. And yeah, I've got my copy of Kirby's Challengers. I have not gotten into it yet. Because it's funny, we've all been on a trade kick. I had picked up a couple of trades. Uh, our store had had gotten some good deals and brought them in, and of course I took advantage of it. And I read two Superman trades that involved the Phantom Zone. The first one was actually called Phantom Zone, and it was a mini series that was from the early '80s, and I remember picking up these books when they come out. And I think this was actually my introduction to Gene Colan because I did not read Tomb of Dracula at the time or, or some of the other stuff he did. So I'm pretty sure this was my introduction to him. And it was written by Stephen Gerber. And it's a great little miniseries of where... Uh, Superman and a uh, a former prisoner of the Phantom Zone were trapped in the Phantom Zone while everybody else had escaped and they were planning to destroy the Earth. And then the other one is called Tales from the Phantom Zone, which is basically a collection of stories from the 60s, mainly Superboy stories, which kind of surprised me. I didn't realize... Superboy had dealt with that much with the Phantom Zone back in that time. Uh, but there was a couple Superman stories. There was a Lois Lane story and a Jimmy Olsen story, which tells you, hey, yeah, this is the 60s. Uh, I mean, the Lois Lane story was Lana trapped Lois and uh, Lori, Lam- Lori Lam- Lamaris, the, the mermaid. In the Phantom Zone, so she could have Superman all to herself. This is the 60s, so what do you expect? <laughs> okay, so, su- so Superman's in a some sort of strange relationship with two Earth women and a mermaid. Is that like a menage a trout? Wow. Wow. <laughs> Please note that I am laying off. <laughs> I had We're to, laying out. I wanted, yeah. to, I wanted to beat less to the bad joke. <clears throat> oh, no, you had that one all to yourself. Yeah, that, that was, yeah, that was all on your own. There you go. <laughs> Take your bow. Um, but it also includes the story uh, of uh, introduction to Monel. Uh-huh. Which, uh, you know, you know, they they first thought he first thought it was Mono was his uh, his brother from Krypton, and then found out well, no, actually, it's not since he has a different type of weakness. But you know, it's kind of, I mean, it's sixties story, so some of it obviously is kind of, you know, it's Silver Age stories. But it, but the thing that was kind of funny is one of the sto- one of the stories in here is actually kind of leads into the other trade because it involves that, that care, the, the form. I can't, what the hell is that guy's name? Uh, 
the former the former prisoner who was released a uh, uh, QX QX Yule who was released and he had lost his memory as well as his powers so he lived he he lived on Earth. He actually worked at the Daily Planet. So it was kind of funny because I read the tales from the Phantom Zone after I read Phantom Zone. So it was like, so it was fresh in my memory. Uh, I was like, well, okay, that's kind of cool. I didn't, didn't really mean for that to happen, but yeah, it was, it was neat. Got a little prequel action going on there. Yep. So yeah, next on my list is going to be that Challenger. So I've been, I've been excited about that. I flipped through it and. A couple of those stories seem familiar. I may have read them through some of the reprints that were done back in the 70s as part of, I don't know, the Super Team families or some of the other big uh, anthology books in, of the day. But uh, cause they, they kind of look familiar. But it's, it's still going to be fun to check it out because I know a lot of it I have not read. Well, I want to thank you, too, for setting aside a couple of those books for me. The Dominic Fortune uh, and a couple of others that I'm wanting to get to myself. Yeah, I knew you liked that Dominic Fortune, especially since uh, Jake and who created who created him in the first place. And that's your guy, and he actually wrote and drew this one, so I knew that would be right down your alley. Yeah. Tell me, what you think of? Uh, Colin's work then. Oh, I love Co- I love Colin's work. It, it's kind of you know I I still kind of establish, uh, think of him through the horrors the the horror material, but he he actually does a really awesome job of the heroes because I mean everybody's in here. I mean you've got Batman, obviously you have Superman, and then there's Wonder Woman and Supergirl. Uh, the arts, uh, the art is just great, and the story is just—I don't want to say crazy, but it's kind of—it's kind of just off a little bit, and there's kind of a darkness to it that kind of plays to his strengths as well. Because I've—I've seen—I've seen Colin's work with uh, with uh, other superheroes. Uh, the one I can remember off the top of my head is the early Captain Marvel, and it's the Marvel version, the Marvel. Yeah, uh, he he was the one who did the earlier issues, and I love that stuff. But there there's a there's kind of a different vibe with this mini series, and it's really cool to look at. I highly recommend if if you get a chance to pick it up, I I would I would highly recommend doing it because it's a really good story and visually it's just I think it's incredible. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Before we get into this week's topic, I want to take a couple of moments to thank our sponsors, uh, the fine folks at Things from Another World for supporting the Fellowship of the Geeks. Uh, right now, they're just running their evergreen deals, but you know that will be changing. So as, as we get closer and closer to the big day, hey, it's almost Christmas. But the evergreen deals they're running right now, hey, it's 40% off of comic statues, toys, and merchandise. 30% off pre-order manga titles. And, of course, the ever-popular 50% off Nick and Dent comics and trades. So, if that sounds good and you're curious to see if there's any other deals coming up, just go to our website, www.thefellowshipofthegeeks.net. Click on our Sponsors tab. Uh, you'll see information. You'll see all the latest deals. And there's some links that will take you to their website and let them know that we sent you their way. And just have some fun. And thank you guys for your support. All righty. This week's topic. This one kind of surprised me I hadn't thought about it until I saw some mentions and and some celebrations but uh, just a, a week or two ago was the 25th anniversary of a very important event in in comics this was you know how the industry and certain publishers say something is a a earth-shattering 
event or, or something like that. This literally was one because this made national news. This was in the newspapers. This was on the six o'clock news. This was on probably your local news too. And what I'm talking about is the 25th anniversary of the death of Superman. Now, obviously, he was not the first character to be killed. He's not the first superhero to be killed. But this this one, this was such a big event. This is something no one ever thought would ever happen. I would say that much. I think that's not really going out on a limb. So when they did this, I, th- I think it blew everybody's mind. And it so it we, made a few waves. It made some waves. <laughs> so I figured we would uh, take some time, stop down, and discuss the story and discuss its impact. And uh, with that, I am opening up the floor. Who would like to go first? Let's see. When this came out... It made the news, like you said. It went as far as the uh, as CNN doing stories about it. I'm going to look at the portion first of how it affected sales. Sales went through the roof. It was difficult to find anyone carrying a copy of this comic book. Because they got word from CNN that this was happening. And as a result, people kind of overreacted and just pushed the the sales bar so far out of reach for anything else. Uh, It... I can't say that it crushed the economy for comic books, but when you've got people making trips across town to see if somebody has a copy of this comic book, to me that's that's out there. That's way out there. Yet it was considered a pivotal point in comic book history which it was the thought that uh, a character who was considered untouchable uh, getting the axe more or less was unheard of yet it uh, in this instance it was cleverly done so I thought uh, I thought they pulled it off very well, but like I said, for the the collector, boy, you were pretty much SOL if you hadn't ordered one prior to this. You were not going to find one. I personally, I was lucky enough to set one up long before. And I'm glad I did. So, to me, it's a shame that so many people did not get to try this. Yet, how many times did it go back to press? And that was, what, Superman 75? Yes. I know of, I know of at least three printings. I think there was four. I can look real quick. Because I I had inherited from my uncle. Now, this is the 90s, so a lot of this stuff was happening as one of these kind of marble plaques. And I'm, I'm talking marble, not Marvel. M-A-R-B-L-E. The rock. And it, you're right. And it had taken, it's, it's uh, had a couple of the trading cards. I mean, it went, they went so far as to do a trading card set based off this. Uh, attached to it and then there was also a copy of 75 and it, it had the Roman numeral 3 up there in the 
corner box. So that tells you, hey, this is a third printing, which I thought is is great. I think that's something that actually needs to happen now because it seems like what they do, or, it, or at least what DC does now, is if they do a second or third printing on a book, they use the same Im- they use the same image, but they may recolor the background. Or they'll do, or do they'll do something just a little bit different. It's just so it's kind of the same cover yet not. But hey, that's just me. Um, and then and then there was a, a little thing on there saying the death of Superman. So yeah, there was at least three printings of this issue. Right, which doesn't sound like much now, but the printings were a lot bigger back then. Yes, yes, the yeah, the print runs were a lot bigger thing. And this was this was not just about a superhero dying because, like Les said, that had happened plenty of times before. Mm-hmm. But Superman was more than just a superhero. Superman was was created, and actually, they did a pretty good job over the years of maintaining him as a symbol. And the idea of killing a symbol, I mean, there. That's that's a that's a hard thing to get away with, right? Um, I mean, any parallels that I could come up with would be disturbing as hell. So, it's it's the kind of thing that I mean, it, yeah, you're thinking you think about it as being oh yeah, it's a comic book, but you know, it's not just a comic book. It's Superman, and this is 15 years after the movies, the 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 Christopher Reeve movies. So this Superman is not, and the hit, Superman have been on TV over and over again over the decades. So the exposure was not just to comic book fans here, and then to to get it all on, like you said, major news outlets. Holy cow! I mean, you're just you're out there telling everybody. I mean, that's the kind of publicity that DC could have could only have dreamed of. There's no way that was... I mean, I, I imagine some of it was planned, but it blew up. There's no way they expected that kind of reaction. I mean, if they had, they might have done a bigger print run. But, yeah, and so it was... It was... It was oh, man. To say, to, to, say, to say it was big is a, just a ridiculous understatement. It's just... It, it's... Like I said, I mean, earth-shattering is as good a term as any. It really did kind of stop the world a little bit there. Yeah. Okay, according to comicspriceguide.com, there was four printings. And that's not counting the number of books that were in the poly bag with the red S kind of dripping. And then there was a what they call the platinum edition, which is the same dripping S except for it was in silver or gray. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, there's there was quite a few copies of this book made. A friend of mine gave me a copy of it framed, and I think it was a third print. But just to have that in a frame is pretty nice. Yes, it is. Yep. Let's go back though. The character Doomsday appeared four months earlier but it, uh, but it was on single pages right it just, it just it's at some point during a I didn't mean to interrupt you there at no. some point during a story there would be like one panel where you see a fist hitting against uh, a wall and then that's it yeah and then it kind of it was a slow build up Mm-hmm. It, it, it kind of it, now that I think about it, it's kind of what they did with Mr. Oz now and in and, and before Rebirth. So yeah, it was a slow build up, and then when you finally when you uh, what was it, it was like a couple pages in the issue prior toward this what you consider to be this story arc, and you finally see. Who and what it is. Uh-huh. Um, 
And I'm sorry, I didn't really mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. I didn't mean hijack it for you. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. What I recall, though, is that it was each issue was just a single page, the last page. I think so, yeah. Can, can, uh, concerned itself with the coming of Doomsday. And it was well worth going back to find those missing issues to make sure that you had the full story. That's when DC was running four uh, Superman titles. And it was a, uh, to me, it was a great buildup. I think it was a real steady story and uh, culminated in Superman 75. Uh, and Thomas and I have discussed it before that if you look at the story, uh, it was getting down to how many panels per page. Yeah, there was a countdown on the panels. Mm-hmm. And when you got to the death of Superman, you had one panel per page, a splash panel per page, and it was truly effective. Yeah, going back and looking, because I pulled out my trade to kind of go over uh, go over this again. Yeah, it was like uh, you know. It be four panels, and then it was three panels, and then it was two panels, and and the thing was, is it wasn't just standard, you know, it wasn't just like four same size panels on a page. It could be one panel being most of the page, and then there's three smaller ones. So they they mixed it up so where it wasn't so obvious. And I thought that was that was very effective too. It, you, you didn't, if you weren't really paying attention, you didn't notice that this was going on. And then yeah, the that last issue seventy five, it was all one, one image a page until right at the end. And then the last two, then it was actually a fold out, if I remember correctly. The where it was it was two it was two pages. And then there's two pages that you that you pulled out, so it was actually like a four page of 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 him laying out dead in the arms of Lois, and you saw the members of the Justice League and and then uh, the Harry and them, well, the ones that were yeah the ones who were not in the hospital were dead right yes, and and then and then Perry and 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 some of the a daily plan of people, you know, it's, it was, it was beautiful. I mean, it was handled so well. It was such a great story. And visually it was, it was awesome. It, it was powerful. It really was. And I mean, that was, that, that was basically an all bets are off. You know, you're killing off a hero before, you know, it was usually a lower tier up until, until crisis, and then that's when they they had killed off Barry Allen Flash, they had killed off Supergirl, and then they had killed off several other heroes from the multiple Earths. They they, they killed off the original Dove, which was it Don Hall? I can't remember his name. I think that's it. And then that you know that was it. And, and nowadays it's so. It's so overused. I mean, we've we've already done a. I think we've already done an episode on it. That it's it's not really effective anymore. You know, they kill someone off, and the and the readership and people like us are going, okay, we're taking bets on when this character comes back. But at the time, that was not something that was done. I mean, the the villains, yeah. I mean. They fall to their quote unquote death, and you figure, okay, well they're dead, but they're villains; they'll come back. But heroes, it was a little something different. If they if they died, they were gone. Right, and if if you if you look at it, I, I think you probably find that this was one that sort of started that precedent as well. Yeah, because this you was the nineties. Yeah. After all, the yeah. nine, lots right. lots of people died, and it 
I mean, it, it, it happened a little bit in the 80s, too, but not anywhere near like it did in the 90s. No. And this one kind of popped the cork, as it were. Yeah. Well, I mean, he was a trendsetter. He was the first superhero, so, I mean, might as well. Yeah, first one I mean, to die and come back. <laughs> and it was so yeah. successful, they were just hoping, I, I mean, no lie, they were just hoping to capitalize on that. They were hoping it would be as successful, or at least some large fraction of the success of that. And yeah, I mean, you you do it enough times, you dilute the the stuff quite a bit. But it loses effectiveness. It does. Like I said, we 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 become jaded. We don't. When they die, we're going, yeah, sure. We don't believe it. Right. We don't believe it. I mean, not only was the the death affected so imp- impactful, but what happened afterwards. You know the 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 ring of Superman, which those characters, for the most part, are still around. So uh, that's kind of, you know, you have steel, you have the cyborg Superman who turned to be the bad guy, uh, Radicator who's now a bad guy, uh, that Superboy we have not seen yet in Rebirth, but who knows. But it just, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's I, I think, I, th- I think we don't realize it was, it was a big event, but I don't think how we realize how impactful it was. And then, I mean, it impacted a lot of people because people got upset the fact that they killed them all. But uh, just, but I mean, just the effect of the industry and and just the the whole scope of, uh, or maybe not scope, that maybe not the right word, but just it, it, it changed the presentation. Yes. Of comics. Thank you. That's kind of where I was leading, but doing a horrible job. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we need to credit the people who who. Uh, Brought this forward. It, obviously, uh, Mike Harlan being the, the 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 group editor, and Dan Jurgens, uh, Roger Stern, Louise Simonson, Jerry Orway, Carl Kessel, uh, just to name a very few that were on these books. Because, like you said, Les, it was it was it was four main Superman books, and then you also had the Justice League book because he was a member of, of the Justice League at that time. So yes. they had to be part of it as well. That's True. that's that's a lot. You know, during the nineties, they did something with the Superman books that was really cool. Uh, I'm sure I know a lot of people did not like it, but I thought it was a. They made all the books. They, they combined. They, what's the word? They uniformed them. It just it, it was. They even had. Numbers saying, okay, this is say for for nineteen ninety three. This is chapter three, so you can actually read them in a chronological order, where before and after you can read a, super, a Superman book, and then you can read an action book. And if you really were wanting to know which one came first, if if that was important to you, you. You, you would not have a clue, at least during this time they did that, and I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah, that was very important to DC at that time. I think the reason they came up with this is that they were flagging in sales for Superman, although he was as strong as he, uh, could be expected. He just had a, a lapse in there of readership. Luckily, DC came around and said, okay, let's kind of revamp this, not make him into a different person. Although they presented the Rain figures, which did change a lot of stuff. But I don't think they were shooting for that, for their, their big goal. I believe that they were trying to revive Superman and make him viable once again. I believe that they accomplished that. 
Yep. And I think I think this was another example. You know, one one of the things that's been kind of a knock on the character is, okay, it's a guy who can do anything. You know how 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 do you make him interesting? How how can how can you bring him a challenges and all this? Especially the way he was in the fifties and sixties and seventies. He was just kind of this all powerful. I mean, you, you you would read an issue where you know, he flies out in space and moves the planet out of orbit to save for some certain destruction. And and with with uh, with the crisis and basically the reboot by John Byrne and and you know they they took him down a notch they made him a little bit more human and say okay well he's not just this infallible god that is just so ultra powerful that nothing can stop him that you know. He can be defeated. You just got to figure out how to do it. And this and that was this was this was something else because believe me, the readers that the, were reading the books in the sixties and seventies never would have thought this would have happened. No. Anyway. See, and honestly, that's kind of the thing that gets me about this. And yeah, um, this is this is this may this may not fly real well, but feel <laughs> free to direct your comments at me, folks. I, I honestly had a problem with the way he died for that very reason that you just mentioned. He, he doesn't, I mean, sure. They took him down a notch in power so that he wasn't like completely invulnerable, but it should, it still should take some conscious strategy to, like you said, you use the phrase, find a way to kill him. That's what I wanted to see. I wanted to see, somebody actually being smart as opposed to just pounding him and pounding him and pounding him and pounding him and pounding him. But nope, that's what we got. We got pounding him and pounding him and pounding him ad nauseum. And honestly, the part that probably bothered me the most was that his reaction was to just pound back. I mean, that, admittedly, this whole thing, this whole story from from. Superman landing in front of Doomsday for the first time and the end I mean you get the sense that this didn't take long I mean this battle this was a battle and it probably didn't take more than an hour or two of normal time even though it took what the better part of three comic issues something like that it, it took all four I mean, I mean sure it was quick but you still expect your golden boy to be able to think up a better strategy than, no, wait, let me just hit him one more time. This one will make the difference. I mean, he practically even says that several times throughout. Well, maybe I just need to hit him harder. No, obviously not. You hit him harder, like you've already hit him harder like seven times. You've watched your allies throw everything else they have other than hitting him at it and it hasn't worked it, it, this this just seemed to me to be a failure of problem solving and i know i'm over analyzing it <laughs> or at least i'm analyzing it in the wrong direction but i mean for me and i i do not wish to offend anyone i i disagree that this was a good story i thought it was the story that i thought it was a story that needed to and turn out the way it did I see how they got from point A to point B, but I think it should there should have been more in there. I think it, there should have been more thought process somewhere along the line. I mean, you're clearly not going to get it from Zoom's day, so it's got to be soups. And so I really was disappointed that he didn't think any more than he did in this book. And I've seen, I mean, the variations on the story that I've seen since, I mean, like the, the animated feature that they did. Actually, I'll admit, I saw that first. I didn't read this. I read the trade of Death of Superman recently for the first time. I really didn't like the Doomsday movie because I thought it 
was kind of a dumb fight. Well, come to find out, I read this trade and find out, oh, no, it was actually fairly true to the, to the source material. It was a dumb fight. It was a fight that Superman lost. And I don't mean just got literally got the life pounded out of him. He lost the fight, but he lost it in his head, not in his body. Again, do not, my, my, my opinions, do not take them out on Les or Tom. It's all me. If I may, I uh, believe that Superman had never really been the thinking person to defeat someone. As far as his appearances in the Justice League comics, it was Batman that was the thinker. Batman would tell Superman what to do and would think around to try to defeat a villain. Uh, I don't remember that Superman was ever requested to be the big uh, thought machine. He never needed to be the smartest guy in the room. No. And as a result, even in this fight, he was not truly uh, the most intelligent person. He was more intelligent than his opponent. But that also doesn't say much. Because Doomsday was nothing but a pounder. Yeah, like you said. Literally never even that. strung an entire word together of dialogue. No. Mikey, I, I think you actually bring up a fair point. Um, I think I give him a little bit more credit in the smart department than Les does. But he's not he's not really the tactician. Um he can figure things out and yeah, he, he, this is something he probably, and this, this is something that, you know, it's, I, I, now that you, you mentioned it. Yeah. I mean, I, I can, I can see what you're, where you're coming from that there should have been a little bit more of a, okay, well, obviously beating the crap out of him is not working. What do I need to do next? And, well, and, and it, 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 it could be it's it was a caught up in the moment type of thing, and, which and, right. but still that's that's not a, giving an excuse, but well, it just you know it, it's a, it's a function of the story, and I'll grant that. I mean, like like I mean, I pointed that out at the beginning. This whole fight maybe took two hours of real time. Right. Right. He didn't have time to think about it much, um, and in his defense, and in defense of the story. He does actually say at least twice, I've got to find another way to do this. Just punching him isn't working. And, of course, the problem is is that he's thinking while he's punching him. And so the punching never really stops unless Doomsday jumps away real fast and and leaves him in the, tu- in the dust. And then he has right. to fly really can't go catch up to him and then start pounding him again before he can start thinking about what his strategy is going to be. So, I mean, so I guess in the sense that maybe it was intentional that this was intended, the story was intended to exploit a known weakness in the character of Superman. I can accept that to a point. That's, I mean, that's fine. I, I, I don't, I don't like that. That's what it is. If that's what it is, but that's it's not my story. So I'm not trying to take it over or anything. But I, I just, I wish they hadn't done that to quite such a dramatic extent. I wish they had actually beaten him as, as opposed to allowing him to beat himself. Yeah. I don't know. Well, and, and what I would say to you what, from what you were just saying, if, if doomsday is not beating up Superman, he's beating someone else up or doing some other damage and putting other people's life in the line sure. on the line. Sure. So, so yeah, Superman didn't obviously would not want that to happen. So, yeah, right. He, he was trying. I, I, I would I would say that in that kind of defense, but uh, but you do bring up a valid, valid point. So yeah, it's just for, from my perspective, it was. I mean, I didn't 
hate the story. I'm not going to go that far, but it was slightly disappointing that it, that, I mean, even if they're exploiting Superman's um, lack of, honestly, most of the time he doesn't need to think on his feet that much because he can pretty much survive anything. It's, it's, it's a, you don't really have to learn to, to outthink your opponent when you can just sort of stand there and take whatever punishment they're handing out. Well, this this time he's quote unquote met his match, and he's those those parts of his brain which should be trained to think like Batman a little bit are a little rusty, and it cost him. And that's just a little frustrating for me, from a story perspective. But again, this whole thing is not just about the story either. I mean, all of, it's it's about a major cultural impact that this whole thing had. It was. It was giving readers what they thought were was impossible, and putting a at least semi plausible story on it, and that had probably way more impact than they intended. I mean, I'm sure they were hoping for the biggest possible impact, but I bet they weren't ready <laughs> for what they got. The stories that followed. Of course, you had the reign of the Superman, but prior to that was the Funeral for a Friend series, which went eight issues, I believe, covering the four titles for Superman, plus I think two titles for, or uh, two issues for Justice League. And... As modeling as it sounds, I thought they pulled that off too. I think they were able to continue a story that was relevant to the DC universe. And there again, I applaud them for what they accomplished. Yeah, it's relevant to the DC universe, but I think it also helped with that cultural impact thing. I think they, I think they, a lot of what they did right after, put some, put some stress on the whole, what now, thing, the whole shock and awe of the concept of the death of Superman. I think they, yes. I, think, I think they did a good job of teasing that out. How long was it before Superman returned? I think it was about a year or so. So you got new, some new characters. You got some heroes. You got some villains. So yeah, it was effective. No two ways about that. And unfortunately now, it's way too easy to kill off a, a character. Like Thomas has said, and not try to place a bet as to when they'll be back. It's too easy to uh, even think about trying that business. Well, and they, and they even added a little radio silence after the after the fact, after Funeral for a Friend. They they stopped all the Superman titles for three months. Yes. To just kind of add, it's just it's just punctuation on it. At that point, it's just like, yeah, this is over. They did a they did a very nice job of making it really seem like it was over before they started filling the holes. I forgot about that. Cool. Any final thoughts? Uh, you out there in the public, uh, our dear listeners, we would love to hear what your reaction was to the. Uh, to reading the story either when when it originally came out or since then that we would definitely like to hear your thoughts so uh, send send that send that to us we would definitely want to check that out yep. but uh, any final thoughts before we wrap things up take a break mm, no I mean it's one of those big stories that you kind of you almost wish you could talk a lot longer about but you know I don't, I don't know that we can say much more here. Yeah. I think we're good. 
Prove Les? me wrong. Prove me wrong, Les. Um, no. <laughs> no, I don't think that's even possible. I, I think it's way too strong a story. And they're after me. Mm. Uh, it's something that's going to be around for a long time. And hopefully the listeners have read this because it is a freaking gem right there. I can't say anything more about it. It is a very important piece of comic book history. That's for sure. Alrighty. On that note, we'll take a quick break and come back with picks and hopefully we'll have less with this. And we're back. It is time for our weekly picks, and I lead off today. And for my first choice, it's uh, Action Comics 993. Obviously, this is from DC. Written and illustrated by Dan Jurgens. Uh, this is a first chapter new story arc where uh, Superman actually goes back in time to verify that... This is actually jor and Booster Gold's involved in this story arc. He's going with Superman because, you know, we're dealing with time travel and all that, so um, this has been intriguing. The whole thing with Mr. Oz slash jor has been really an interesting read, and i, I like to see where this, where this is going, and... Like I, this is like I said, this is the first chapter, uh, first part of a new story arc, and maybe we can get some answers to verify that this is actually jor which I believe it really is. I don't think it's some imposter. I think it's a real deal. I love it. They, they, Superman's like, okay, I need an expert on time travel. Who do I know? Who do I know? Who do I know? Booster Gold. <laughs> hmm. Which, of course, is a character created by Dan Jurgens, well, the current writer of Action Comics. So, yeah. All right. There you go. Fair enough. Who also, kind of going back to our our topic, was a writer on, on Superman. He had, <laughs> so, a, he had a hand in that. He did. And and, and the, the actual issue was, was his art. So. All righty. Mikey, you are next. Okay. My first pick is a Titan book. Um, I am picking Hercules, Wrath of the Heavens. This is issue number five. Um, And if you are not familiar with this particular title, it is very interesting. It is, I mean, obviously it is, it involves Hercules and some of the Greek mythology. But the setting is like a really crunchy, hard sci-fi setting. So this is like out in space and very, very hard, crunchy stuff. And the art, it fits that setting perfectly. The art is just phenomenal in this book. And the story has been really interesting. I mean, it, there has been, it, they've made some, they've rearranged some, some things to kind of spice things up in terms of telling the story of Hercules and his, and his, uh, Oh, crap, what's the word? Trials, I guess, is a good, is a good word as any. And, but, yeah, it's it's a really pretty book, and it's it's a really fun story, and it's 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 got some some interesting, fun violence, and it, because it's Hercules, he's beating the crap out of stuff. That's kind of what he, that's kind of his thing. So, um, very cool book, very cool book. It's, it has been a good read. I will agree with that. Yep. Is that an ongoing, or is this a miniseries? I'm not sure. I have not seen an endpoint. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean there isn't one. Right. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, to be honest, I actually thought about that a bit ago, and I have not seen anything that says there's an endpoint. I, I had neither, so that's that's kind of cool. I mean, if it you know, if the stories are good and there's enough support, then it you know it may go on for a bit. That's cool. That would be very cool. Yep. Alrighty, Les. My first choice comes from Titan Comics. Christopher Beck and Stefano Raphael 
bring you under number one. This is a two issue series and it kind of reminds me of the Quatermass movie of the late fifties, early sixties, where something is underground. Uh, you have a, a character who has been demoted to uh, starting to walk the sewers and he is joined by a, a scientist who wants to know about the legends of whatever's underneath the ground as they're doing this there is a threat that is about to crawl out and attack the city so to me this is going to be fun it's a short like i said a very short series but uh, if they can pack enough action and storyline in this for two issues i think that's that's tremendous it is going to be a, a higher price comic than most of your titles so to me that means a larger page count and the opportunity to finish that story. Yep, looks pretty cool, cool to me. Yep, agreed. All righty, uh, for my second choice, I'm going with Marvel, and it is the return of Marvel Two and One. Uh, the book is written by Chip Zardowski, with art by Jim Chung, and this is. Human Torch and the Thing, the Thing, they are together again. Um, and this is uh, the first chapter of a book, a story arc called The Fate of the Four. Apparently Johnny and Ben are, are going to start uh, trying to find where Reed and Sue is and try to get the, get the band back together. This is as close as we're going to get to a Fantastic Four book for a while, which, you know, if you're, if you're, Hearing the story, hearing the news recently, you know there there may be a little bit more of a chance of a Fantastic Four book coming back in the not too distant future, but uh, we'll just see. But um, I've missed this pairing. Uh, I would like to have all four, but hey, I got fifty percent of it, so I'm gonna check this book out and and see where we go from here. Well, it'll be fun to see what they do with the whole two-in-one concept now, too. Yeah, that yeah, that's the thing because the two-in-one was Ben's team-up book back in the seventies and eighties, mm -hmm. which I kind of I kind of I enjoyed because uh, it was nice to see him team up with other other heroes. Now, whether they go that route again or they just revive the name just so they can have Johnny and, and Ben in one book together. Who knows? Either way. Or they could do, uh, like, random pairings. Well, that's, yeah, that's, so, or, or, yeah. Who knows? There's a lot of options. Yeah. There. Yeah. So we'll, we'll just have to see. Yep. Yeah, I want to see this, too, because they've been out of the limelight way too long. And that reminds me of the days that they ran one of the two stories in Strange Tales. That title they shared with Doctor Strange. Right. And uh, it was that was an ongoing, and it was always good. It's a fun read. I'm surprised that Marvel hasn't tried to collect those, because you're looking at 10 pages or 12 pages for a story and you could just pack a book with uh, I, all that stuff. I think they've collected like the Doctor Strange portion as part of the omnibuses or collections, but as as actually doing a collection of the complete issues, I don't think they I don't think they have done that. That would be that would be cool to to, to read. I would like for them to do that with some of the other stuff. Uh, was it, uh, was it Tales of Suspense or is it Tales uh, or Tales to Astonish that was 
you had one that was like Iron Man and and Captain America, and then there was another one where it was it was Hulk and and Namor. Uh, uh, Tales to Astonish was Hulk, and the other was uh, Cap. And okay, Tales to Suspense. Okay, yeah. Yeah, uh, the, the the individual stories have been collected as in like uh, in omnibus or maybe collect or epic collections, but as to my knowledge, the actual books themselves have never been in a collection form, and it would be actually kind of cool to to read that. My problem with those, the problem I would have with it is the problem I had. Because I had bought one of the collections of uh, Life with Archie uh, a while back, and for those who are not familiar with that, that was the kind of Elseworld tales where Archie had married. There, there was part of the book was where he married Betty, and the other part he was married. Uh, the other story he was married to Veronica, and this was this ongoing series. So when they collected that, they actually kept it in book form so that means you're reading say 10 pages of the Betty story and then if you want to read the next chapter you got to flip about 10 or 15 pages and then read that <laughs> so so it's kind of a mixed thing for me I mean I would love to see them collected but you know it's <laughs> so I, I don't know but that yeah would drive it, me crazy it would yeah it would drive me crazy but I, I think for just just for the sake of actually having those actually collected for the future uh, future readers to have a chance to read them, I think that I think they need to do that. So, but I don't make those decisions. <laughs> Alrighty, Mikey. Okie dokie. My second pick is a dynamite book. Um, this one is titled Skin and Earth. This is issue six of six, so this is definitely the last issue of this. Um, and it is a uh, this is a really it's actually a little hard to uh, categorize. Um, I, I, I would probably call it a dystopian romance, although romance may not mean exactly the same thing to me or to this book that it does to everybody else. Um, but it's it's been a very interestingly woven story with really pretty art. Um, yes. And yeah, and it's this 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 like I said, this issue should wrap the thing up. So it is definitely worth taking a look at because it's very very pretty. Agreed. The art has been phenomenal, and this is at the and. Correct me if I'm wrong. It's written and illustrated by the same person who's actually, I can't remember her name, but she's actually got an album out now, too, right? Yes, I believe so. So, so she's a musician as well as a writer artist. So, so she's very multi talented and I have not checked out her music, but you know. If she's just as good at that as as she is with this book, um, may have to check it out. It'll be something to listen to, that's for sure. Yep. Alrighty, Les. My second choice is Judas Number One. This is a four issue series from Boom Studios. Jeff Loveness and Jacob Rebelka are the creators of this one. And this deals with Judas Iscariot uh, and how he has to journey through life and death and how much of his part was preordained. Uh, it's a tale of forgiveness, uh, redemption, and just for something different, I thought that this might be a, a good choice. Since it's a four issue, it'll be done by March. So I'm thinking that that might be close to Easter for the ending. <laughs> I wonder if that was on purpose. Yeah. I got a feeling it is. Probably. Yeah. It might have been. But I'm kind of, I'm kind of wanting to see this. 
Yep, could be interesting. Yeah, uh, this was on my radar, too. I'm always a little concerned when we start dealing with religion in comics, because I know that's always a hot topic with people. But um, I'll definitely want to check this one out. I'm, I, I'm definitely intrigued. All righty. Since we are down a person this week, well, since Liz is not with us, we went back to our traditional format of uh, all of us having honorable mentions. So my honorable mention is from Archie Comics, and it's called Marvel Comics Digest number four, and this features the X-Men. I've been digging these digests, uh, and, and what they've what they've been doing is it's a collection of uh, stories from maybe the 60s or 70s, depending depending on. I'm, I never have heard what the the selection process is, but there's usually some from the either 60s or 70s, and then there's 80s, and then there's some within the last 10 or 15 years. So it's usually a nice collection about eight stories or so. And they, uh, it just, I, it's been kind of nice to kind of go back and look at some of these stories. Uh, of course, the more recent ones are the ones I have not read before, but, uh, it's, it's great to kind of go back and, and read all of it again. So I, I definitely recommend these to pick up. Yep. Definitely worth checking out. They do have a tendency to find stories that are either interwoven or significant, even possibly to what they're doing in their titles now. Yeah. So you may get a, an introduction of a character or the death of a character, something that's going to be affecting what's uh, in the series as it is. They've been great reads, and to go back, and in this case, you'll get to start with Kirby's artwork, because they'll more than likely have the number one reprinted in this uh, in this collection. And it's a cheaper way to get a lot of these issues than uh, scrounging. Than those epic collections Tom was talking about last week? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this is this is a better this is a better way of sampling it. I think if you're if you're looking to sample something, yeah, this is a good choice. This is a good way to go. Yeah, yeah, I I agree. And their selection process is is kind of kind of interesting because they you know they, they they do it on purpose. The first one was Spider Man, and it came out at the time when the movie came out. Uh, then you had the Avengers, and then. Four came out, and of course that's when the movie came out. These are bi-monthly, so the last one was in October. Like I said, it was just right around before the four came came out. Uh, now we got X Men. The next one's already been solicited for February, and that one is called The Avengers, featuring Black Panther. Well, oh, cool. guess what movie? Guess what movie comes out in February? Mm. <laughs> Fantastic Four. That one with Black the, Panther in it, I think. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> All righty, Mikey, your honorable mention. Okay. Um, my honorable mention is from Zenoscope, and I'm going to jump on the bandwagon that we all that, that got started last week and and recommend Grim Fairy Tales twenty seventeen holiday special. Woohoo! Um, because to be honest, Zenoscope usually does a really good job with their specials. Um, there there's often a lot of very cool stuff in there. So it, it, again, this is this is actually strange. And I, I didn't really intend this. This is actually a good way to, if you want to sample some of what Zenoscope's got going on. These specials are great for that uh, because they're usually good, cohesive stories with Zenoscope's usual standard of art, which is very high. Um, and there's often usually a handful of different characters involved in one way or another, either working together or just in separate stories. So and it's they, they do they have fun at the holidays, put it that way. So definitely take a look. 
Yeah, I agree. Uh, that that's it's a nice way to kind of get to learn a little bit about the characters, or you might want to branch out into the regular books. So yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. All righty, Les. My honorable mention is the chair number four of four. This is by Alterna Comics. Peter Sinetti and Kevin Christensen bring this one. This is the final issue of the series, so it's to me it's going to be fun because uh, it, it's been a fun read to begin. And they even have a tag in here saying, read the comic before you see the film. So I think I'm going to have to do that myself. I'm going to have to read the comic, then I'll go get the film. Uh, I'm ready for this. Well, Mikey and I will tell you that you will you will definitely find the ending intriguing. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Um, <laughs> It's yeah. It th- this this is a great story that Mikey and I had the opportunity to read before, and I'm glad that we it's actually uh, had an opportunity to reach a, a wider audience now, especially with the uh, newsprint format and a lower price point. It, it, I'm I'm excited about this. Uh, I really dig the cover. It's a nice uh, killing joke homage if if you've not seen that. And, and, and the one I'm talking about is the scene of the a Joker origin when he when he gets out and he ha- he's got his uh, head in his hands and he's laughing with the big grin. Once you see the cover for the chair, you'll go, oh, I know that, I know what you're talking about. Uh, so it's a great homage. It was intentional and it's beautiful. Uh, so, yeah, good choice. Definitely good choice. That was on my list as well. Mm-hmm. Thanks. All righty. Any special mentions or, or shout outs? Uh, obviously, once again, uh, Liz, get get well soon. Hopefully, we'll have you on again next week. We missed you. Anything okay. else? Mm, not for me. Uh, just to iterate, Liz, come back soon. I, I do want to take a. I do want to take a moment. I know we uh, uh, we have a very nice sponsor from Things of Another World, but I do want to take a moment to mention and plead for all of you out in the audience to support your local stores, especially this time of year. There's always some good deals at the local store, and you're also helping. You're you're helping the federal citizen, so if you can, please do that. Uh, this is a kind of a make or break time of year for for those people. So, so with that, yep. I'll get to our regular shout-outs. Uh, first off, uh, Manny the Martyr for uh, our Awesome music for our podcast. Uh, you should definitely check out their check out their music. We will have a link in our show notes. Uh, you can also go to the website and click on the podcast page, and you'll see our logo. And just click on that, and now that'll, that'll get you there as well. So thank you guys. Uh, obviously, want to thank the fine folks on Twitter. They're part of the Potter and family for supporting us, um, retweeting our links, and and spreading the word of the fellowship. That's always appreciated. If you're looking for any type of podcast, anything you're looking for, just go to Twitter and do a search, hashtag Potter and family, one word, and go to town, and you will not... You will not be disappointed. Definitely check check them out. And thank you guys for your, your support. And finally, you dear listener, thank you for the for downloading and listening to today's episode. Appreciate your support in the past. 
Big shout out. We broke the 2,500 downloads uh, this this past week. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you very much. You know, some podcasts may think that's that's nothing, but you know, we're a little we're a little we're a little podcast that's just doing. We're just we're just having fun, and obviously, y'all are enjoying it as much as we are. Uh, just by looking at the numbers, and we do appreciate your support. Uh, we always value your feedback, uh, questions, comments, suggestions, complaints, whatever. We're always willing to listen and try to respond as best as we can. And there are several ways you can do that. You obviously go to the website, www.thefellowshipofthegeeks.net, and go to our About Us page, and uh, there's a form there you can fill out. You can always send us an email, and that address is email at thefellowshipofthegeeks.net. Uh, you can contact us through social media on Facebook, The Fellowship of the Geeks. Feel free to follow us there. Uh, we're obviously on Twitter, at Fellowship Geeks. Feel free to follow us there. You can follow our personal accounts as well. Uh, Mike is at, at Mikey Geek. Liz is at Newman underscore L. And I'll spell that out for you. It's N. E-U-M-A-N-N underscore L. And I'm at Tom TC Geek. Feel free to follow us there. And wherever you download or just listen to our podcast, whether it's through iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, YouTube, iHeartRadio, and soon to be what, Mikey? Well, I put in the stuff to get us put on Spotify. Woohoo! We may be on Spotify here soon. Please feel free to rate us, whether whatever system they have, whether it's stars, thumbs up, thumbs down, or our numbering system, whatever you can, whatever you can do, that would be much appreciated. And if you have an extra moment or two, a review would be awesome as well. Uh, did I miss anything? Uh, I think you nailed it. All right. Any final thoughts before we wrap things up? Just thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Hope to hear from you. Thank you once again for listening, uh, guys. It's it's much appreciated. Once again, season's greetings. We're only, yeah, the year's almost over, guys. It's hard to believe. It's hard to believe that 2017 is almost a, a memory. But until until next time, read more comics and support your local stores. We thank you for listening to the show. Comments, suggestions, and questions can be sent to email at thefellowshipofthegeeks.net. You can follow us on Facebook at The Fellowship of the Geeks. And on Twitter at Fellowship Geeks. Until next time, 